Chapter 33. Garrett parked behind his uncle's truck in the driveway. Dean was here. There were no other cars in sight. Would Aspen have parked in the detached garage? Only if she planned to stay. But Garrett doubted she'd gone to the trouble. Maybe Dean was waiting for her too. But his pickup was empty. Had they gone somewhere together? That didn't make sense. But Garrett couldn't come up with another explanation. Code had already climbed from the cruiser and was halfway up the walk, his gun unholstered and at the ready, by the time Garrett caught up with him. He turned and leveled a hard stare at Garrett. Get back in your truck. I'll let you know when it's safe. Garrett turned that way as if he'd comply. As soon as Coat disappeared inside, he crept that direction. If Aspen was in danger, he wasn't about to sit in his pickup and hope Coat could handle it. Stupid, maybe but two people he loved were involved in this. He needed to know what was going on. He heard Coates' voice but couldn't make out the quiet words through the storm door. Then Coat yelled, McCarthy, get in here. Garrett bounded up the steps and into the house. He froze at the threshold. Uncle Dean was seated on the sectional, but he wasn't seated. He was slumped forward, his shirt stained red. Coates said something, but Garrett couldn't make out the words over the roaring in his ears. Jesus. He felt unable to formulate more of a prayer than that as he rounded the sectional and crouched down beside his uncle. He touched his neck and felt a pulse. He's alive. Help me. Ambulance is on the way. Lay him flat and try to stanch the bleeding. Coat moved up the stairs, gun still out, and disappeared from sight. Garrett got Dean on his stomach, then snatched one of Aspen's throw blankets from the back of the sofa and pressed it to the wound on Dean's back. I'm here, uncle. You're going to be okay. He'd literally been stabbed in the back. Sounds came from his mouth, but nothing Garrett could make out. Don't talk. Try to open your eyes. Based on the stains on the white sofa, he'd lost a lot of blood. A lot of blood. The blanket, a cheap fleece number, soaked it up. Uncle, are you with me? Don't give up. Dean spoke again, his words so quiet Garrett couldn't hear. Save your energy but he was trying to say something. Keeping pressure on the wound, Garrett angled his ear toward his uncle's mouth. Wasn't her. Wasn't who. And then he realized, Aspen? Of course not. Why would he say that? Aspen wouldn't. But this was her house, and her car was gone. Wasn't her. Who did this? Garrett asked. But Uncle Dean didn't say anything more. You have to fight! Garrett's words were loud in the silence. Deborah needs you. I need you. Please don't die. Garrett leaned down and felt faint breath against his cheek. Please, Jesus. Please, Jesus. Please, Jesus. He couldn't lose Dean. He couldn't. I'm sorry, Garrett said. I'm sorry I couldn't do what you asked me to. I love you. Code hurried back down the stairs. She's not here. Place is empty. What is she driving? Aspen didn't do it. Dean just said, What was she driving? I don't know. A rental, I think. Coates spoke into his radio, but Garrett couldn't focus on the words. His uncle's life was slipping away, and there was nothing he could do about it. Sirens sounded, and a moment later, paramedics streamed into the room. A hand gripped Garrett and pulled him out of the way. It's okay. The voice was familiar. Garrett focused on the man's face. Thomas, his friend, a volunteer fireman, and paramedic. We got this. Thomas all but pushed Garrett to the other side of the room, then hurried back to Dean's side. Garrett couldn't move, just stared as people surrounded his uncle. Furniture was moved. A gurney brought in. Dean transferred. They were in the ambulance and screaming out of the driveway within minutes. Garrett headed for his truck, but Coat stopped him with a hand on his arm. He tried to yank away, but Coat didn't let up his grip. For an old, out-of-shape man, he was surprisingly strong. You don't know what Aspen was driving? You're sure? She didn't give you any idea. We haven't talked since last night. She was getting the rental this morning, but I haven't talked to her since then. He took a breath, let the question fully enter his brain. Grace probably took her to get the car. Maybe she knows. She'd know where. What's her number? Garrett pulled out his phone, navigated to Grace's contact information, and held it out for coat. He lifted his own cell, then swore. Where's the house phone? Kitchen. Coat started that direction. Dean just told me she didn't do it. 
Coat reached the door that led to the kitchen but glanced back. What did he say exactly? He said, wasn't her. Coat nodded. You're sure because... He said it twice. Wasn't her. The police chief looked around at the cops who'd stream it into the place. He seemed to be considering that. Okay. He leveled his gaze at Garrett again. If that's the case, then somebody else was here. Somebody was here. And she's not. Which means she's in danger. Either she's a murderer or she's in the hands of one. He stepped into the kitchen. A uniformed officer followed, and Garrett did a moment later. A lamp one Aspen had bought at Trudy's the week before lay on the floor. The uniformed officer crouched beside it. That's blood, he said. Blood. Aspen's blood. Another uniformed police officer came in through the back door. No sign anybody's been out there. Garage is empty. Garrett stayed out of the way, hoping to hear something that would give him hope. Coat had Aspen's house phone pressed to his ear as he crouched down. He was talking to Grace, but Garrett didn't pay attention to his words. Pieces of ice and glass littered the floor, all resting in water. Someone had dropped a glass of water and made no effort to clean it up. Two sets of wet footprints led from the kitchen and through the breakfast room. Two sets. Aspen's and someone else's. Garrett followed them into the living area and to the front door. A uniformed cop had already seen the footprints. Garrett watched him as he stood from where he'd bent over the faintest ones on the stoop, then walked down the three steps to the walkway, gazing at the driveway. The snow had started as flurries when they'd been headed up the mountain, but it had picked up. This storm was predicted to be a doozy, dropping a foot or more across the state before it was finished. The flakes were already sticking to the cold asphalt. Any tracks that might have been there would be covered up in minutes. Aspen was out there, somewhere. He swiveled when he overheard Coates speaking into his radio, ordering an APB on a car, presumably Aspen's. Did he really think she'd done this? When Garrett had followed Coat up the mountain, he hadn't passed any cars headed down. If Dean had only been stabbed minutes before, then that meant Aspen and her captor must have gone the other direction. Coat could have cops all over the state looking for Aspen's car, but they weren't going to find it, because her car wasn't heading towards civilization, but away. He pushed out the front door and down the three steps, where he spoke to the uniformed cop who still stood there. They had to have gone up the mountain. The man nodded. We'll find her. Wasn't that your uncle? Garrett recognized the cop as someone he'd gone to school with. He nodded. We've already notified your aunt. Why don't you head to the hospital? Give me your number and I'll call you when we find the person who did this. That made sense. Deborah would need him. If the worst happened, if Dean didn't pull through, Deborah would need him all the more. Garrett pulled a business card from his wallet and handed it to the cop, Gladstone, according to the name tag on his uniform. Gladstone gripped the card, but Garrett didn't let go. Aspen Kincaid, the woman who lives here? He leveled his gaze at the man. She didn't do it. My uncle said it wasn't her. We'll get to the bottom of this. Maybe, but when? When would they start looking for her? At the moment, they seemed more intent on figuring out what had happened than they were on finding whoever had attacked Aspen and Dean. She didn't do it. She's not a danger to anybody. She's in danger. I understand. Did he? Or was he placating him? The cop tugged the card. Go on to the hospital, Garrett. We'll be in touch. Sure they would. But to tell him what? Garrett let go of his business card and jogged to his pickup. He should be with Deborah. She needed him. But Aspen, police cars had blocked him in. He engaged the four-wheel drive, yanked his wheel to the side, and drove across the snow-covered yard. While he bounced over the terrain, he debated. Left to town and the hospital, or right to Aspen. As soon as his wheels hit pavement, he yanked the wheel to the right. Dean had paramedics and EMTs and nurses and doctors and Deborah. Aspen had nobody, nobody who cared enough to find her, Nobody who believed in her, nobody but Garrett, and you, Lord, protect her, lead me to her. Chapter 34 Aspen had been whispering a constant stream of prayers ever since she'd been locked in the trunk. The first couple of verses of the 91st Psalm filled her mind and her heart as she begged God for help. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I abide in your shadow, 
You're my refuge. I trust in you. She couldn't remember the rest of the words, only that the psalm promised protection. Protect me, Father. Save me. Only he could save her now. She was defenseless, utterly defenseless. The car hadn't traveled far when it slowed down and took a sharp turn. It stopped, and she heard a mechanical hum, which lasted only a few seconds before it stopped. The car moved forward slowly. Salcido had pulled into a garage. Were they at his house? Garrett had said there were only summer homes higher up the mountain. Maybe Salcido owned one. But why would he own a summer home in the town where he lived? She didn't understand. Not that it mattered. They were here, wherever here was, and Salcido was going to kill her. Even so, she would trust in God. The only person who cared whether she lived or died was thousands of miles away, spreading the gospel in Kathmandu. Aspen had never really had her mother's love. Her father had adored her, but he was gone. There was Garrett. If Dean was telling the truth, he cared for her. He'd be sorry if she didn't survive. The thought of him brought a sob. She'd treated him so poorly. She should have trusted him. She should have at least let him explain. If she could go back and undo one thing, that would be it. If she'd believed in him, then he would have been at the house with her. She wouldn't be where she was. None of this would be happening. She'd been stupid. Maybe Garrett wouldn't forgive her, even if she were given the chance to apologize. But Aspen wasn't defined by the people who loved her or didn't love her. Her worth wasn't wrapped up in other people's opinions. Her future wasn't defined by her past. It certainly wasn't defined by her parents' past. Maybe she was the daughter of a murderer? Maybe she was the daughter of two murderers. But before either her mother or her father had existed, God had known Aspen. He'd loved her. He'd chosen her. He'd died for her. She was her father's daughter. Her mother's daughter. But mostly, she was God's daughter. He got to decide who she was. He decided her worth. And God thought Aspen was priceless. A car door opened and closed. Then there was nothing but silence that stretched for minutes that felt like hours. She kept praying. It was all she could do. Her head pounded. But it was better than it had been. The blood on the back of her head didn't seem to be flowing anymore. The low ache of nausea that had plagued her since the blow at the house, even more so in the trunk of a moving car, faded. She'd suffered a concussion, no doubt. That wouldn't be what killed her. She figured a gunshot would do that job. Please, Father, please save me. Suddenly, the trunk lid opened, and light filled her vision, sending shard-like pain into her head. She closed her eyes against it, then opened them slowly, shielding them with her hand until they adjusted. Brent grabbed her arm and yanked her up. Let's go. He helped her step out of the trunk and onto the concrete floor of a garage. Two cars were already parked there, including a silver sedan with a dented front fender and a long scratch along its right side. The car that had forced her off the road two nights before, which reminded her, you're supposed to be in Maine. I was. I stole a friend's keys and drove his car back here, then switched it with the car my friends leave here year round. I'll have their dent fixed by the time they come up this summer. Nobody'll miss you at the retreat? I'll show up for the dinner tonight. My car has been there all along. The whole point of the retreat is to spend time alone with God, so yes, nobody'll miss me. Clever, diabolical. How'd you get to my house? I walked, it's less than a mile, all downhill. Glad I didn't have to walk back up. Past the car, a door led into the house, but with a firm grip on her, Salcido pulled her the other direction to the driveway. After they stepped outside, he tapped a keypad on the threshold and the garage door lowered. The snow was coming fast, covering everything in a veneer of white. It would hide whatever tracks they'd leave. Cold wind had her shuddering as Salcido led her around the garage and onto a walkway that had been recently shoveled. They took it to the back and rounded the house toward a deck covered with inches of snow. When they reached the stairs leading up to it, he said, Sit here. She did. Melting snow seeped through her jeans seconds after she sat. Her knees were already wet from crawling through ice water on her kitchen floor. She wore no coat, no gloves, no hat.
He could simply tie her to the railing and leave her there, and she'd freeze to death. She looked past him at an amazing vista. The trees dropped off, giving her a beautiful view of the lake and the mountains on the far side of town. At least it was a pretty place to die. He looked down at her. I'm sorry it had to come to this. Her teeth chattered. You would much rather have k killed me two nights ago on the road, I g guess. It would have been easier, he admitted. Easier still if you'd just recorded what you'd learned in your laptop. I hacked into it, but I didn't find anything about what you'd figured out. So he'd been the one to break into her house. You should have stolen my n n notebook. He might as well have, for all the good it had done her. All her careful planning. And here she was, about to die. If she got out of this, she was going to burn her notebook. She'd rather follow God's plans for her life than her own, anyway. Like Garrett had said, the notebook didn't keep her sane. If anything, her compulsive need to follow her carefully laid out blueprint had thrown her off course. Nope. From now on, she'd trust God with her future. If she had one. Unlike her, the mayor was properly dressed in a puffy parka, a black skull cap, and black gloves. I was really trying to avoid the conversation you and I have to have now. She crossed her arms against the chill and tucked her fingers beneath her armpits. It didn't help much. C -c -c conversation You know where your mother is. I need to know. I don't understand. She paused through a chill. You didn't kill her, so why do you c care? His eyes narrowed. Why do you say that? Which part? She'd ask the question, but she was pretty sure her jaw was freezing shut. Her toes were already numb. Her fingers stung. How long would it take to die of hypothermia? Surely longer than she'd been outside, but she was so cold. She'd never been so cold in her life. Why don't you think I killed her? Brent asked. If you d d d did, she shivered violently, you'd know where she is. He leaned against the railing beside her. That's a logical conclusion. He blew out a long breath. You're nothing like her. You look like her, no question. Your voice is so similar, it's eerie. But you're so rational. Aspen didn't know what to say to that. If Jane were in your position, she'd be panicking or making baseless threats. She'd be screaming, thrashing, trying to get away. What would be the point? Nobody's going to hear m m m She couldn't finish the sentence for trembling that took over. His smile was sad. See what I mean? Rational. If Jane had only been a little more rational, he didn't finish his sentence either. Though not, she guessed, because of the cold. Tell me where Jane is. So you can k k kill me f faster? At least you'll be out of your misery. Your concern for my well-being is t t touching. He crouched down until his face was inches from hers. Tell me where she is. Did it don't know. I was outside when Dean was at your house. I heard you tell him you knew where she was and that you hadn't yet told Coat. He'd listened to their entire conversation. No wonder he'd killed Dean. But Dean had confessed everything to Deborah, and Deborah would tell Coat. Did Deborah know that Salcido had worked with Aspen's mother? If so, then even if Dean died, Salcido was going down. Dud, Deborah knows. She'll t t t tell. I heard all the lies Dean spun, he said. One thing I've learned in my years as a lawyer and a politician is that when an unexpected situation crops up, you work the problem in front of you. I'll deal with Deborah later. First, I need to find your mother. Where is she? Aspen shuddered both from the cold and from his words. How would he deal with Deborah? Would he have another murder on his conscience? Assuming he had a conscience? Not until you, she paused through another shudder. Tell me what happened. If I do, you'll tell me where she is? So you can let me f f freeze to d d d death? He shrugged out of his jacket and slipped it over her shoulders. His lingering body heat enveloped her as she pushed her hands into his sleeves. He zipped it up, his closeness sending a whole different kind of quaking through her body. But he backed away quickly. Better? She nodded, hating herself for loving the warmth he'd given her. She took a few breaths and forced herself to calm. She was still cold, 
but it was tolerable with the jacket on. I came to find out what happened to her. At least give me that. He sat beside her on the stoop. The narrow staircase had him too close, but she wasn't going to complain if it meant she'd get to breathe for a few more minutes. Everything went according to plan until we got there that night. The building was dark, but there was a car in the parking lot. We decided that if we thought anybody was there, we'd leave. But Jane, he shook his head slowly. When she decided to do something, nothing could stop her. Chapter 35 Thirty years ago, it was a miracle Jane hadn't been pulled over after the explosion. Maybe not a miracle, though. Every police officer, fireman, and paramedic in town, probably within a few towns, was headed to the site of the explosion. Nobody was looking for a red hatchback, not yet, and the overlook was only a ten-minute drive from the lumber company along back roads that wound through the forest and past summer houses that were mostly abandoned in March. Though Jane drove, she seemed to have lost her grip on reality. Brent feared that something in her mind had snapped. He directed her, afraid she'd forget her destination. She did what he told her to do, but when he caught her eyes in the rearview mirror, it was obvious that she wasn't all there. They drove up Rattlesnake Road, past the condo development that was under construction, and the one house on the road. Slow down, he said. I'm parked right. But she zoomed past his car. Jane, you need to drop me off. It was empty. The building was empty. Fine, it was empty. Turn around and take me to my car. But she kept going, all the way to the top. Then she slammed on the brakes, and they screeched to a halt. She jumped out before slipping it into park, and he had to reach into the front seat and jam the gear shift forward to keep it from driving into the woods. She'd lost it. She'd completely lost it. He didn't know what to do. All his planning his careful plotting, and she'd blown it. She'd broken the first rule, the one rule they'd all agreed on, and murdered a woman. It could only have been a woman. He'd heard her voice in her sobbing, a sad woman, alone in the building. Please let her have been alone. Jane was running toward the overlook, going too fast. He followed her. He didn't know if she was trying to kill herself or if she was just too far gone to understand what she was doing. A tiny part of him thought maybe it would be better if she flew over the edge. But he pictured her body at the bottom, broken and bloodied. No matter what she'd done, he loved her. He was faster and caught up with her before she careened over the edge. He grabbed her wrist and yanked her back. What are you doing? You're going to kill yourself. Her eyes were wild, insane. She yanked something from her pocket, lifted it, and brought it down toward his head. He managed to deflect her hand, catching the glint of metal an instant before pain registered in his palm. A knife? She'd sliced his palm with a knife. He didn't know where it had come from, only that if he hadn't seen it coming, she'd have stabbed him in the chest. What are you doing, he asked. Stop it, sweetheart. You need to pull it together. But she was out of control. She reared away, took a few steps back, closer to the edge of the cliff. It wasn't far down, maybe 20 or 30 feet, but she probably wouldn't survive a fall. Please, Jane. He kept his distance, afraid that if he stepped closer, she'd back away. Another two or three steps and she'd go over. Listen to me. It's going to be okay. It had to be. They could still fix this. We just have to follow the plan. You remember the plan? But Jane wasn't listening. She wasn't there. She let out a visceral scream and came at him again. He managed to grab her wrist and turn the knife to the side an instant before her body crashed into his. He lost his balance, and they both tumbled. She landed on him. He wrapped his arm around her and turned her over so he was on top. He needed to get her under control. He needed to pull her back from... from wherever she'd gone. He needed to reason with her. He pinned her wrist to the ground and levered himself up over her. You need to listen to... His words faded as he took in the sight. He'd angled the knife outward, out toward air, hadn't he? But there it was, protruding from Jane's neck, blood spurting from the wound, painting the ground crimson. Jane, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. He pulled out the knife and pressed his hand to the wound as if stopping the blood flow might save her life. But in the moonlight, he knew the truth. Her eyes were no longer wild. They were empty, empty of the woman he loved. She was gone. 
Only a few seconds passed before he heard the sound that must have been there all along. Someone was there, breathing heavily. He stood and came face to face with Michael, Jane's husband. Brent didn't know what to say. There were no words to fill the silence between them. The silence hovering over the body of the woman they both loved. Michael spoke first. It was you, wasn't it? The explosion. He'd heard it? In town? Or had he already been up at the Overlook? Would it have been so loud? Brent didn't know. He should have known how far away it could be heard. He hadn't considered that in his planning. Michael crouched down beside Jane. He reached out as if he might touch her, then pulled back. Fury rose within Brent. You never loved her. Not like I do. You stole her from me, but you never loved her. Michael gently closed Jane's eyes. How can you be so calm? Brent screamed. She's dead. She's calm. Michael sat back on his heels and his shoulders heaved. Moments passed. Finally, he looked up. In the moonlight, Brent saw the wetness on the man's face. You just killed my wife. It was self-defense. I didn't mean for it to happen. She came at... I saw what happened. He stood, shook his head. I'll tell them. You won't go to prison. For that, anyway. He started across the dirt toward the road. When Brent looked that direction, he saw what he'd missed before. The black minivan he'd always sneeringly thought of as Michael's dad car was parked farther up the road, nearly hidden in the darkness beside a thick bush. He was going to get in it, drive to his house or maybe the closest payphone and call the police. And then Brent would go to prison. You'll be implicated. He didn't yell the words. He didn't have to. Michael stopped in the middle of the asphalt and turned. What are you talking about? In the bombing, Jane set it up to frame you. The other man's gaze flicked from Brent to where they'd left her. In her state of mind, I'll take my chances. She couldn't have done it by herself. You're right about that. Michael's eyes narrowed. What does that mean? The person who made the bomb did it with your tools, wearing your clothes. We kept all that stuff along with hair Jane collected for us. All that evidence will be sent to the police station tomorrow. Again, he studied the body that lay behind Brent. Why? He sounded perplexed, hurt. Why would she do that? She needed an alibi. She was going to ask you to tell the police she was with you tonight. Michael closed the distance between them so fast that Brent barely had time to step back. It was your idea, wasn't it? I was trying to keep her out of prison. Nice going. If only you'd tried as hard to keep her out of the grave. The words hit their mark. Brent stumbled back. His legs suddenly felt like jelly and he barely kept himself from falling backward. Over the cliff and to his own death. He went to his knees, then leaned onto his hands and vomited. His body was beginning to understand what had happened. It would take his mind and heart some time to catch up. When he sat back on his heels, Michael was still standing there, glaring down at him. So you and my wife, and Dean, I guess, decided to blow up? Was it the lumber company? Brent said nothing, but Michael had put it together. Her plan was for me to meet her here, then go home with her as if we'd been together the whole night. She was going to blackmail me into telling the police she'd been with me. Do I have that right? Brent just nodded. And then, what? We'd go on with our lives? He scoffed, shook his head. No, you knew I wouldn't be able to live with it. I'd leave her, and you'd step in. You did all this. He gestured as if he could encompass all the horrible events in the sweep of his arm as one big elaborate scheme to steal my wife. Brent crawled away from the vomit and forced himself to stand on shaky legs. And now she's gone, Michael said. Brent couldn't stand the condemnation he saw on the other man's face. He averted his gaze, then caught sight of the glow in the forest below. A fire, caused by the explosion, caused by the bomb. Had they found the woman's body yet? There were no secrets between them now. Michael needed to know it all. Then hopefully, he'd do the right thing. Do right by Brent anyway. The building wasn't empty. Michael's eyes widened. We'd agreed not to do it if there was anybody there. But Jane... He closed his eyes against the memory of her face when she'd run from the building. The pure, unadulterated joy he'd seen. She decided to do it anyway. You should have stopped her. He didn't bother to explain what had happened. It didn't matter now. Your wife murdered a woman, 
and you're going to be implicated. You can tell them I was with her, but nobody will be able to prove that. It'll be your word against mine. Maybe they'll believe you. Maybe they won't. My partner will mail the evidence to the police station tomorrow. The police will follow up on that. Jane will be dead, and you'll be implicated in what happened here as well. Maybe none of the charges will stick, but maybe they will. Maybe you'll get sent to prison. Maybe your little girl will grow up knowing her mother murdered an innocent woman, and her father murdered her mother. Michael cringed as if the idea caused him physical pain. Or, Brent said, we hide her body. Everybody's going to believe she set that bomb off. And she did. The blame will fall exactly where it should. They'll come after me and my partner, but we'll both have alibis. Nobody will be able to prove anything. Jane will disappear. Just be gone. The world will think she realized what she did and ran away to avoid facing charges. He wasn't sure what he expected Michael to do. Yell at him, maybe come after him, maybe collapse. But the man stood his ground and said nothing. Brent added for good measure, you'll get to raise your little girl. And you'll get off scot-free. His words were cold. I didn't kill her. You know that. You know it was self-defense. You set off the bomb. You. I didn't set it off. I tried to stop her. I failed. I see now that I should never have. She was losing it. I thought I could keep her under control. If you'd backed me up when I tried to have her committed, Michael's words trailed and he blew out a short, humorless laugh. I knew she was a danger to herself. You knew she was a danger to others. But you kept that tidbit to yourself. He had. It was stupid and he'd never forgive himself. None of that mattered now. If you take me out, then I'll take you out. You and I will both lose. But you know who'll lose even more? Michael didn't answer. He didn't have to. The truth was written across his face. Aspen meant more to him than justice. His daughter meant more to him than anything. He loved Jane out of obligation. He loved Aspen from a place of pure adoration. The details were spinning and setting themselves in place in Brent's mind. It's very simple. You take Jane and the knife. You bury them somewhere. The knife has my blood on it. He lifted his hand to show where he'd been cut registering only then the blood dripping down his arm. You can take my jacket, too. He shifted so Michael could see where Jane's blood drenched the arm of his canvas coat. And then, Michael asked, you have evidence against me. I have evidence against you. We both leave here tonight and say nothing about what happened. We claim we don't know what happened to her. We haven't heard from her. We keep our mouths shut and we go on with our lives. Just like that? Brent lifted his shoulders, let them drop. I'll never forgive myself for what happened tonight. Michael stared at him a long moment. Not exactly a fitting punishment. Brent couldn't hold his eye contact. He slipped off his jacket and dropped it on the road. Then he walked away. When he was well past Michael, he broke into a jog until he reached his car a few hundred yards down the mountain. He went home, bandaged his hand, changed his clothes, and left with his father for the city, hoping Michael would keep his mouth shut. Chapter 36 You just left her there? Aspen's words seemed too loud in the silent, snowy world. Brent stared ahead at the beautiful vista. The gun rested on his lap, but he never let up his grip. He gestured with his chin. It was probably right around there. She followed his gaze to a break in the trees. Boulders had been positioned between the land and the drop-off, but they were spaced far enough apart that anybody could get past them assuming they'd even been there back then. This was their overlook? Aspen asked. My dad had a friend in the city looking for a summer home. He bought this property not long after Jane died. I've been coming up here for cookouts for years. My son takes care of the place when they're not around. That's why I have the garage door code. I've never once been here that I didn't think of her. Sure, you obviously loved her so much. What with how you blackmailed my father so you wouldn't have to face what you did. You think I'm proud of that? I think you're a coward. He let those words settle. So was your father, I guess. My father did what he did to protect me, not himself. Poor dad. Aspen's heart broke for him. He'd faced an impossible choice. He would have known it wouldn't be easy to take on the town's richest family. It would have been him 
a widower and single parent who poured cement for a living, against the son of the county prosecutor and the former mayor. Maybe he'd have been cleared. Maybe he wouldn't have. Daddy had agreed to Brent's crazy scheme to protect her. Of that, she had no doubt. And she knew something else, too. Whatever he'd meant to say before he'd been intubated a year before, she'd misunderstood. He never would have sent her back here to face all of this. He never would have put her in this danger. He'd wanted to do himself what he hadn't before, had the courage to do. He certainly hadn't meant for Aspen to do it. If only she'd realized that. But she'd needed to know what happened to her mother. Or she'd thought she had anyway. Now she knew. How would her life be better for the knowledge? Brent shifted beside her, reminding her that her life wouldn't be all that affected by what she knew because it wasn't going to last that much longer. Now you know the story, he said. Where is she? Your plan is to dig her up, I guess. Destroy the evidence linking her to you? My plan is irrelevant to you. Where is she? It's not going to work. Even if I tell you where she is, you won't be able to get to her. You let me deal with that. Wherever she is, I can get her. Not if Mom was buried under cement. I don't know for sure. It's just a guess. Even if I don't tell Coat, he's going to find her. The plan has already been set in motion. What plan? She wasn't going to tell him about the ground-penetrating radar Coat had arranged. That kind of radar could see through cement. He knew what Dad had done for a living. He'd figure it out. When they find her body, Aspen said, and they will. You can tell them what happened. That you acted in self-defense and then panicked and buried her. Maybe they'll believe you. But if you kill me, she turned and leveled her gaze at him. That'll be the crime you burn for. He swallowed hard. They'll have to prove it, but you're going to disappear. They'll know. Like they knew I was involved with the bombing, yet here I am. He lifted both hands and let them drop because it's not about what they know, it's about what they can prove. And without a body, without a murder weapon, they won't be able to prove a thing. You're a monster, you know that? I'm just a man. A man who made a stupid decision a long time ago. A man who got away with it and intends to keep getting away with it. He pushed to his feet and looked down at her. Where is she? Aspen shook her head. I'm not going to tell you. He lifted the gun and pressed the barrel against her head. Where is she? The feel of that cold, hard barrel. The knowledge that he could take her life with the squeeze of a finger. Terror overcame her. A scream crawled up from her belly, but she clamped her lips shut and pressed her eyes closed. And breathed. In and out. In and out. She focused her thoughts elsewhere, on the sting of the cold air the feel of downy flakes landing on her nose and cheeks, the sound of the wind whispering through the trees. Whether at the top of a mountain in New Hampshire or at the edge of the world on a Hawaiian beach, God had created a planet filled with beautiful people. People like her best friend and her father, who'd loved her so well. People like Garrett, who'd tried to protect her. Garrett, whose heart would break. Would he live the rest of his life not knowing what had become of her? Would he believe she'd killed his uncle and then escaped? No. Garrett would never think the worst of her, not the way she'd thought the worst of him. Forgive me, God did, and Garrett would. In time. Protect him, Father. Let him have a good life. She had. Maybe not as good a life as some, but certainly not as bad as others. At least she didn't have to live with what Brent Salcido had lived with for 30 years. At least she didn't have to spend her life dragging around a weight of regret. Her God had freed her of all of that. If this was the end for her, so be it. The gun pressed harder against her skull, jabbing into her skin and making the ache from her concussion throb. She was done with it. She was done with all of it. She wasn't going to just sit there and let him threaten her. Whipping her hand up, she whacked the gun away and then opened her eyes. What had she done? Salchito was off balance. She'd surprised him. She pushed up and rammed into him, sending him sprawling, and darted around the house, expecting to hear the roar of a gunshot, feel the sting of a bullet. But he didn't pull the trigger. She darted into the trees between this house and the one beside it.
these houses were too close together to offer very much in the way of forest between them. Salchito crashed through the woods behind her, uttering obscenities under his breath. Why didn't he just shoot her? Because he wanted to know where her mother was. As she reached the neighboring house, she took a deep breath and screamed. She screamed as loudly as she could, praying the sound would carry. To whom, she had no idea. Maybe one of these houses was occupied. Salchito was gaining on her. She had to find something to defend herself with. But there was nothing. Nothing. She ran toward the trees on the other side of the house, managed to get out of the yard and into the woods again. But Salchito was close. Too close. She snatched up a fallen branch covered in snow. She turned, took a swing. But the branch was longer than she'd realized. It whacked a tree trunk nearby, vibrated with the impact, and fell from her frozen fingers. Salchito dove and tackled her. She landed in the snow. She inhaled to scream, but his hand clamped over her mouth. He glared down at her. You're going to wish you hadn't done that. Chapter 37 There was nothing on this road, nothing but tracks, which were already being covered by the quickly falling snow. Garrett had been slowly following those tracks on the narrow road in the thick forest, keeping his window open, hoping to hear something, maybe see something. Aside from the low hum of his engine, the world was silent, until he heard a scream. He pressed the gas harder and went higher up the hill, past houses, until the road ended in a cul-de-sac. The tracks led to a house. He parked, jogged up the driveway. Somebody had driven into the garage, but footprints led around the back. He crept that way, staying as quiet as he could. In the distance, he heard a low thwack, but he couldn't see anybody. Where was she? Chapter 38 Aspen stared up into the furious face of Brent Saltito, the man she'd met at church the previous Sunday, the man who'd bought her pastries at Cup of Josie's. That man was gone. This man didn't wear a mask of kindness. His eyes were bulging, his lips drawn back in a sneer. He straddled her, holding her arms over her head in a tight grip. She struggled to wiggle away, but he outweighed her and overpowered her. His other hand clamped down on her neck. He squeezed. You're right, he said. I can explain away the knife and the jacket. It'll be clear I hadn't been the one to kill her and bury her, or I wouldn't have hidden those things with her body. Aspen gasped for breath, the world darkening around her as Salchito's fingers pressed against the arteries in her neck. She tried to wiggle out of his grip, but he was too strong. She was utterly powerless. I'll come up with a story about how your father found us together, Brent said. How, in a fit of jealousy, he attacked me and killed his wife. How I didn't tell the truth, because I was afraid I'd be implicated in the bombing. You're right, Aspen. If they find your mother, I'll figure a way out of it. I always do. He bent lower, low enough to whisper in her ear. I always hated you. I know it's wrong to hate a baby, but I loathed you. You were the reason she married Michael. You were the only thing keeping Jane from me. I know it's too late to get Jane back, but I'm not one bit sorry to kill you. His fingers tightened, clamping over Aspen's windpipe. In fact, I think I'll enjoy it. Blackness crept from the edges of her vision until all she could see was the face of the man who would end her life. So she closed her eyes. Father, expose all this man's evil deeds. Protect Jaslyn. She'll grieve for me. Wrap her in your arms and comfort her. Protect Garrett. Please let him know I would never hurt his uncle. Bless him. Give him a good life. If only she could have known his love. If only she could have experienced life with him, slept beside him, seen the faces of their children, held his hand, and walked with him into old age. If only everything could have been different. Suddenly, she felt free, free of pain, free of the weight of her murderer. It was over. She gasped in a deep, full breath and opened her eyes. Chapter 39 Garrett crept in the direction of the sound. It had come from a neighboring property. It took precious seconds to pick his way through the forest between the houses. Aspen wasn't in the yard next door. Garrett hurried past then into the woods again, 
where he saw a man on the ground propped up on two arms. One hand was pressed into the ground. The other was pressed into the neck of the woman Garrett loved. He charged, tackled the stranger, rolled him over and onto the ground, but he kept their momentum going until Garrett was on top. He landed a punch to the man's face, only then getting a good look. The mayor, Brent Salcito, the man who'd claimed to love Jane Kincaid, had tried to kill her daughter. Garrett punched him again. Salcito was big enough to overpower a woman, but he had nothing on Garrett. Salcito landed a few blows against Garrett's side, but Garrett hardly felt them as he punched the man a third time, then a fourth. Salcido quit fighting and moved his hands to protect his head. It took considerable effort not to punch him again. But Aspen, he pushed up from the ground. Salcido had quit fighting. His eyes were closed. He turned to find Aspen still lying on the ground, eyes open. In a flash of panic, he feared she was dead, but he could see the vapor rising from her mouth as she exhaled. He wanted to go to her, to pull her into his arms. He wasn't going to leave Salcito alone, though. He stood. Aspen, are you injured? She shifted to look at him and smiled. I thought... The words came out raspy and she cleared her throat. Are you really here? He wasn't sure what she meant by that. Can you walk? Um, she pushed herself up to sitting and must have seen Salcito at his feet. Her eyes widened and she looked around on the ground. Where is it? What? This? Salcito's voice was cold, angry. Garrett dove, registering the moment his body hit the snow what Aspen had been looking for. Thank God his instincts had pushed him to act before his mind managed to catch up. The gunshot was deafening in the silence. Garrett rolled, didn't pause to check if he'd been hit. Salcido scrambled to his feet. Garrett barreled into him a second time. This time they crashed into the trunk of a tree. Salcido's head bounced off the hard wood, and he pitched sideways. Garrett took advantage of the blow to the older man's head. He yanked his opposite arm and twisted his body. The mare landed face down in the snow. Garrett snatched the gun from his limp hand, stuck it in his pocket, and rested one knee on the man's back. He fought to catch his breath. The shifting of bracken, the snap of a twig, told him Aspen was moving. Are you all right? She asked. I'm fine. He hoped he was anyway. He didn't feel any pain, but he knew enough to know adrenaline could mask it. He didn't think he'd been hit. He looked her way quickly, but he wasn't going to be dumb enough to take his focus off Salcido again. Are you? Yeah, a little dizzy, but... Can you drive? I think so. My truck is parked in the cul-de-sac. Go to your house and tell Coat. Coat's at my house? Yeah, in fact... He pulled the gun out of his pocket and aimed straight up. He squeezed the trigger, then squeezed it again. The gunshots echoed through the forest. Maybe they heard that, he said. Maybe not. Either way, head for the road. If the police don't come, drive down. Are you sure you're okay? He glared down at the man beneath his knee. The mayor and I will be just fine. If the man made any attempt to escape, Garrett would shoot him. He sort of hoped Salchita would try. Chapter 40 As Aspen emerged from the forest, she heard the growl of an approaching engine. She stepped onto the road, and a police cruiser stopped beside her. Chief Coates stepped out. The way he took in her appearance, his eyes wide and filled with worry, she wondered what she must look like. Where are you hurt? It was all starting to register. She'd been hit hard, abducted, nearly killed, rescued. Coat gripped her arm, maybe to keep her from falling. His face was inches from hers as he studied her. What happened? Garrett saved me. They're in there. She pointed into the trees behind her. Other police cars came. Uniformed officers streamed that direction. How had they all gotten there so quickly? Someone wrapped a blanket around Aspen's shoulders and told her to sit in Coates' police car. She did, staring toward where she'd left Garrett. A moment later, he emerged from the woods. Aspen stood to get a better look at him. He closed the distance between them and wrapped her in his arms. Thank God you're all right. She pressed her cheek into his soft sweatshirt. How was it this man never wore a coat? She still wore Brent Salchitos. The man had tried to kill her, had blackmailed her father after watching her mother die. But his coat was warm, at least. How did you know? 
Aspen felt as confused as she was relieved when she looked up into Garrett's face. He was really there. Part of her still worried it was all a hallucination brought on by lack of oxygen and insanity. How did you find us? We were at your house. I saw the tracks in the snow that led up here and followed. Oh! She remembered Dean, and her stomach dropped to the snowy pavement. Dean, we have to call an... He's already on his way to the hospital. He's alive? He was. Garrett looked over her head. I pray he still is. Aspen stepped back. They're going to find my fingerprints on the knife, but I didn't do it. I would never... I know, sweetheart. I know. He set her at arm's length and studied her. What hurts? She considered his question and did a little survey. My head. He hit me with... I'm not sure what. Something hard. She touched the spot. Her fingers didn't come away with fresh blood. She had some aches and pains, but they were nothing compared to what could have happened. Thank you, Garrett, for coming after me, for believing me. I'm so sorry I didn't trust you. He pulled her against his chest again. It's all right. It's over now. She leaned back to face him. Why didn't you go to the hospital with Dean? He squinted in confusion. I had to find you. Salcido meant for everybody to believe I'd stabbed your uncle and then taken off. Even if we hadn't shown up when we did, even if we'd never found you, I would never have believed that. Never. Truly? He kissed her forehead and held her against his chest again. You could never hurt anybody, I know that. One of these days, you're going to figure out how much you mean to me. One of these days, you're going to see yourself as I see you. He'd believed in her, even after everything. She didn't remove her cheek from the soft fabric of his sweatshirt, but needed to ask the question, How do you see me? He held her a little tighter. As the woman I love. Chapter 41 Aspen had been checked out at the hospital and released. She'd given Coat a statement, though not a complete statement. The time would come for that later. Brent Salcido had been taken to a different hospital. According to Coat, he was refusing to talk. The only word he'd uttered since his arrest had been lawyer. She wasn't a bit surprised. Now she sat beside Garrett in the hospital waiting room. Deborah sat on his other side. Dean had been in surgery by the time they'd arrived there. An hour later, he was still in surgery. Deborah said the doctors hadn't given her much hope, but promised to do everything they could. Others had arrived while they waited. Older folks Aspen had never met, along with a crowd of people her own age. Andrew and Grace, James and Cassidy, Braden and Carly, and their baby girl. Tabby was there, though Fitz was on duty. He'd be by when he got off work. Jackie and Reed had come, sans Ella, Reed's little girl, who they explained was with her mother. The way Reed explained that told Aspen he wasn't happy to share his daughter. There was a story there, maybe a story she'd be around long enough to hear. Even Dylan and Chelsea had come. They'd returned from wherever they'd been that week. Each new person walked in, hugged Garrett, and then hugged her. The group had prayed together more than once. None of them had asked for details about what happened. Maybe they realized Garrett's mind was on his uncle, and Aspen. Aspen was still trying to come to grips with the whole thing. A white-coated doctor stepped into the room and assessed the crowd. She was probably in her forties, shorter than Aspen, and couldn't have weighed a hundred pounds. She had dark brown curly hair and hazel eyes. She caught Deborah's gaze and made her way toward her. Aspen was close enough to hear, though the doctor lowered her voice. Do you want to step away, someplace private, or do you mind? Just tell us, Deborah said. Is he all right? The room quieted, and everybody turned to the surgeon, who spoke to Deborah, but raised her voice loudly enough for everyone to hear. Your husband came through the surgery. Murmurs of thank God and praise Jesus rumbled through the small room. Deborah leaned against Garrett who steadied her. The knife missed his heart by a hair. It did plenty of damage, though. We've stitched everything up, and we're monitoring him closely. His heart rate is lower than we'd like it. We're struggling to get it up. We've already done one transfusion, and we might need to do another before the night is over. Her gaze lifted to all the friends. 
if anybody'd be willing to give blood. Absolutely, Andrew said. Where do we go? The woman smiled. I'll send someone in to show you. She spoke to Deborah again. He's not out of the woods yet, but I have hope. Garrett's arm slipped around his aunt's shoulders. He pulled her close and kissed the top of her head. There's always hope. He's in recovery if you two want to see him. Garrett squeezed Aspen's hand and followed Deborah and the surgeon out of the room. While they were gone, Aspen settled on a chair and prayed for Dean's full recovery. She prayed for Garrett's heart as he struggled to understand what had happened 30 years before. And she prayed for wisdom. She was going to need it, because Garrett had expressed his love for her, and though her feelings might not have been quite as deep as his, she was falling hard for the man who'd rescued her, who'd walked with her through the most difficult weeks of her life. She just hoped he'd forgive her for what she had to do now. Chapter 42 Garrett was seated at Dean's bedside when the doctor stepped in Monday morning. She might have been the height and weight of a middle school girl, but she was competent, considering three days had passed since Dean had been stabbed, and he was still alive. But the surgeon's every visit so far had come with caution as she listed all the things that could still go wrong. She told them Friday night, then Saturday, then again on Sunday, that Dean was still in grave danger. Garrett hated that expression. Grave danger. It brought to mind headstones and caskets and death. He couldn't lose Dean, not now, not yet. He muttered his millionth prayer, asking once again for God to heal his uncle as he joined Deborah at the end of Dean's bed. Together they watched while the doctor checked on the patient. Has he been awake much today? she asked. Garrett waited for Deborah to answer, but she was quiet. She'd been unnaturally quiet throughout this whole affair. His aunt, who was usually bubbling over with joy and laughter and stories, had hardly spoken for days. Garrett was almost as worried about her as he was about Dean. Not today, Garrett squeezed Deborah's hand. He woke up for a few minutes last night around 10 o'clock. Garrett had insisted Deborah go home and sleep. There was no reason for both of them to stay all night, and she needed rest. She claimed she'd gotten some, but the dark smudges beneath her eyes told a different story. Was he lucid? The surgeon asked. He didn't say anything. Dean had looked afraid when his eyes first opened, but Garrett had reminded him that he was in a hospital. At that point, he'd relaxed but still hadn't spoken. Garrett had assured him that Deborah was well and at home resting and that Aspen was also alive and well. Then he'd talked about the Bruins game, which he'd just finished watching, and told his uncle how the Celtics were doing. He'd babbled about nothing until Dean fell back asleep. Why doesn't he talk? Garrett wasn't accustomed to so much silence from his aunt and uncle. Thank God for Aspen, who'd braved the snow-covered roads and spent the better part of every day at the hospital with them. She kept them company with her chatter. She brought food and insisted they both eat. She brought magazines and books and had even purchased a deck of cards and challenged them to gin rummy. Deborah had passed, but Garrett had taken her up on the offer. They'd played for hours, and with every tick of the clock, he'd been more convinced that Aspen was the woman for him. He'd fallen more in love with her every time she'd walked through those doors. It's the medication, the surgeon said. The painkillers are helping him rest, which is the best thing for him. She smiled. I'm going to be honest. I didn't think he'd make it this long. The words ticked up Garrett's blood pressure, but he focused on the happiness in the doctor's expression. His heart rate is right where we want it. He's healing well. We're going to start weaning him off the medication today and see how he does. Garrett said, are you saying, is he going to be all right? Deborah's voice held hope for the first time in days. The surgeon stepped closer and gripped her arm. I don't make promises, but if I had to guess, I'd say he's going to make a full recovery. Deborah collapsed against Garrett's chest and sobbed, deep, heart-wrenching sobs. It seemed all the fear she'd been afraid to voice for three days was coming out now, soaking his sweatshirt. He held her close and looked over her head at the surgeon. Thank you. She nodded and stepped out. A moment later, Aspen stepped in. I didn't want to interrupt. Her gaze flicked from Deborah, still in his arms, to the bed, where Dean lay still. Her eyes widened. Is everything okay? It's good news, Garrett said. Aspen closed the distance, and he held out a hand to her. She squeezed it, then stepped near the bed and gazed down at Dean.
You hear that? You're going to be all right. Deborah moved to the other side of the bed. Garrett's eyes tingled at the sight of the woman he loved with the aunt and uncle he adored, his family. But when Aspen looked at Deborah, Garrett caught something unsettled in her gaze. Deborah returned the look. He once again had the feeling that there was a conversation going on beneath the surface, a conversation he couldn't hear. Chapter 43 Dean had awakened for a little while Monday afternoon, but he'd still been confused. Aspen was certain that, when he'd looked at her, he hadn't known who she was. Or maybe he'd thought she was Jane. She'd stayed out of the way and kept her head down. She wanted to be there for Garrett, but she didn't want to cause Dean distress. Tuesday morning, Aspen wasn't sure what she'd find when she knocked, and then stepped into Dean's room. She definitely hadn't expected the beaming smiles sent her way from all three in the room. Garrett rushed around Dean's bed and met her in the doorway with a hug. He's awake and aware. I'm so glad, she said. Is it okay that I'm here? Of course. Garrett took her hand and pulled her to the bed. She guessed that Dean hadn't confessed to his nephew what he'd confessed to her. Dean, Aspen's been to visit every day. Dean's gaze caught hers. He remembered. His confession. His promise to tell Coat everything. I'm glad you're all right, Dean said. You're the one in the hospital bed. She walked to his side, happy to see he was recovering. Ever since they'd arrived at the hospital Friday night, she'd been remembering those last few days with her father, sitting at his bedside, praying he'd wake up, watching as he'd slipped away. She was so thankful Garrett would be spared that pain anyway. How you feeling? He glanced at Deborah, who stood on the other side, before answering the question. Good, strong, ready to face the future. Which meant she had to do the same. It was hours before Dean fell asleep again. When he finally did, she said, I'm going to stretch my legs. Garrett stood. I'll join you. Actually, Aspen turned to Deborah. I was hoping you and I could talk. Garrett's gaze flicked from his aunt to Aspen. Neither of them looked at him. Deborah pushed to her feet. That would be lovely. She squeezed Garrett's hand. You keep Dean company. She led the way out of the room. They walked in silence to the waiting room on the floor. It was empty at the moment, a small favor. Deborah walked inside and sat against the wall. Aspen took the chair at her side and angled to face her. Dean told me he was the one who built the bomb. Deborah's eyes widened in surprise. The look lent more credence to what Aspen had realized Friday night during Brent's explanation of the events 30 years prior. The older woman said nothing. Aspen had options. She could keep what Dean had told her to herself and let Dean and Deborah continue to live their lives as if nothing had happened. She could tell Coat what Dean had told her and let Dean face the consequences of the damage the bomb had done. Or she could tell the truth. But it wasn't Dean, was it? It was you. Deborah swallowed and looked away. Brent didn't tell me any names, but he overheard what Dean told me and said he'd lied. And he told me that the bomb builder's alibi was work. But Dean wasn't at work the night of the bombing. He was in his dorm. You were the one at work. Deborah said nothing, just stared across the space. Dean was trying to get me out of town because he wanted to protect you. Again, Deborah said nothing. Friday night, he told me he was going to tell Coat everything. Earlier, he made that clear once again. He said he's ready to face the future. Deborah's words were flat. I wondered what that meant. She waited for Deborah to say something else, maybe to beg her to keep quiet, but she didn't speak. Why did you do it? Aspen asked. Deborah inhaled a breath and blew it out. Your mother was such a force, Aspen. She changed my life. I'd gone from living this dull, drab existence to being pulled into something that mattered, something much bigger than myself. I just, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be a part. A small smile graced her lips, and she shook her head and met Aspen's eyes. Truth is, I worshipped your mother. I'd have done anything for her. Were you studying chemistry? No. They asked Dean to build it, and he flat out refused. But he and I talked about it privately, 
He told me how it could be done. I think he wanted me to know he hadn't refused because he was incapable. He was always trying to impress me. So you took that information and... Aspen was confused. Did he really give you a step-by-step? -step? He told me enough to know what kind of bomb would be best. There are all different kinds. He'd given me a hint about what materials he would have used. He had books in his dorm. And there were books in the library where I worked. I had access to them, but didn't have to check them out. So there was no record of my having read them. I made copies of what I needed. You drove across state lines to get the materials? It wasn't hard. I went to Vermont once. I went to Massachusetts twice. I paid cash. Did Dean know? He had no idea. But when it was done, she sighed and stared beyond Aspen for a long moment. He never asked me directly if I'd done it. We pretended it didn't happen. We got married and lived our lives. And then I came back, and you were so kind to me. None of what happened was your fault. I've been riddled with guilt for 30 years. Seeing you again, it brought it all back, no question. I figured if I treated you well, you'd never suspect me. I didn't, not until Friday. They were quiet a long moment. Aspen hated what she had to do. She took the older woman's hand. I can't keep this secret for you. Deborah didn't look her way. Okay? I've seen the damage secrets can do to a family, to a community. Bart Bradley deserves justice. He was a horrible man, but maybe part of that was the result of what had happened, of how he'd lost his daughter-in-law, his son, and his grandchildren. Rhonda Patterson deserves justice. Whether the news would give them peace wasn't the point. Aspen had a responsibility to expose all of it. And though she felt guilty, she knew those feelings were displaced. She hadn't built that bomb. She hadn't conspired to destroy a building. She hadn't killed an innocent woman. More than that, Aspen said, I'm not willing to keep this secret from Garrett. I won't let what happened 30 years ago come between us. Of course, telling Coat the truth might do just that. Would Garrett forgive her for what would happen next? Would he be angry at her for exposing his beloved aunt? Aspen prayed her honesty wouldn't change his feelings for her. She couldn't be sure, though. Despite all the worries swirling in her middle, she would do the right thing, the rational thing. That was who she was. She would do her best and trust God with the rest. Deborah said, I've spent the weekend fearing that Brent would tell. He hasn't yet, but if Brent thought it would get him a reduced sentence, he'd turn on Deborah. We should tell Garrett first, Aspen said, then figure out where to go from there. Deborah looked into Aspen's eyes. She ran a hand down Aspen's hair, then rested her palm against her cheek. I'm sure your father was very proud of you. Tears filled Aspen's eyes. I think so. Your mother would have been too, I think. I wish I'd known. There are so many things I wish I'd done differently. I shouldn't have let your mother talk me into the scheme. I should have worked with your father to get her help instead of ignoring all the signs. I'm ashamed of my behavior. Aspen rested her palm on the woman's hand on her cheek, then shifted them both to her lap. I don't understand most of what happened back then. What I do know is that you, my mother's best friend, have been nothing but kind to me. As hard as this is going to be, I want you to know that you have my friendship. I know that doesn't mean much. It means everything. When Deborah pulled Aspen into her arms, for the first time since she'd stood at her father's bedside in Kona, she felt at peace. Chapter 44 Three months later, Aspen parked her new Jeep in the driveway and stared at the house. She'd only been back once since that terrifying day in January. Even then, she hadn't gone inside. That day, she'd followed Chief Coat to the detached garage where ground-penetrating radar had revealed her mother's grave. She'd stopped at the edge of the broken concrete and gazed into the dirt below. They'd removed her mother's remains, but Aspen had wanted to see where she'd been buried. They'd found Jane Kincaid lovingly wrapped in a red and white checkered picnic blanket, Brent's jacket, and a knife with his blood on it next to her. Aspen had contacted her grandparents, who'd claimed her body and taken her to be laid to rest in their home state of North Carolina. One of these days, she'd visit them and see her mother's grave. They'd made her promise 
Her father's parents had traveled from Florida to New Hampshire to hear the whole story, or so she'd thought. Turned out, they'd mostly come to visit Aspen. They, too, had secured her promise to visit soon. Aspen did have family who loved her. She wished they'd all been better about showing it over the years, but she wouldn't complain. When the news broke that Brent Salcido had been arrested, Jeff Christensen contacted Aspen and the local police. It seemed Dad had written a letter explaining everything and had given it to his lawyer before he left town with instructions to make it public if Brent was ever arrested or if Dad were murdered. She guessed that one of the reasons he'd left New Hampshire was because he'd feared Brent might not be content with their arrangement. Dad's letter, along with Aspen's statement, had been enough to put Brent away for the rest of his life. The local newspaper, and a few farther away, had followed the story. Suddenly, Aspen wasn't a villain in everybody's eyes anymore. For a while, people had still craned to look at her, but at that point, most no longer saw her as the daughter of a murderer, but as a hero for solving a 30-year-old mystery. Enough time had passed that recently most people didn't give her a second glance. They were accustomed to her, and she was accustomed to them. She was content. The snow had melted. Today, the house was completely different than what it had been the first time she'd seen it. It was almost eerie how similar it looked to the images Garrett had shown her back in January. She hadn't believed at the time it could ever look this beautiful. Of course, she also hadn't believed this cold, wintry world would ever thaw. Bright green grass thrived on the newly leveled front yard, and birds chirped in the treetops surrounding the property. It was still chilly, though people kept telling her it was unseasonably warm for April. She'd get used to the temperatures. Coventry was a different world from where she'd grown up, different but beautiful. She was coming to love the tree-covered mountains, the sparkling lake, the charming downtown. Even the cold felt cozy. She closed her car door and headed toward the new walkway, which was lined with bushes Garrett had planted. They were small, but they'd grow over time. Already, a few boasted pink blooms. He'd refreshed the cedar siding, which looked brand new in the sunlight, and painted the front door dark blue to match the new shutters. It was beautiful. He stepped out onto the porch, wearing a thin t-shirt and a wide smile. Well? I'm stunned. Garrett had been stunned himself at the news that his aunt had built the bomb that killed a woman 30 years before. At first, he'd wanted to keep the information quiet, wanting to protect his uncle from the terrible news. But Deborah explained that, though they'd not talked about it, Dean had always suspected her. He'd finally confronted her after Garrett had stormed out of their house that Thursday night, and Deborah had confessed. Aspen had told Chief Coat almost everything, but she hadn't told him about Dean's false confession to her at the house that day. If she had, it might have implicated him, made him an accomplice after the fact, that he'd known for about 12 hours should not have landed him in prison. Garrett had come around, mostly because Deborah didn't want to keep the secret anymore. Once Brent was arrested, it was only a matter of time before her part in the bombing would be revealed. It had been hard, but Garrett had stuck by his aunt and uncle, and never wavered in his affection for Aspen. Now he grinned. You haven't seen anything yet. He jogged down the steps and kissed Aspen's cheek. Is it hard being back here? As long as you're with me, it's fine. He stepped back. Well then, you'll always be fine because I'll always be with you. Promise? You know I do. He lifted her left hand, which was devoid of rings. If you'd just say yes. Soon, he dropped their joined hands. I can be patient. It was funny how Aspen grieved for a woman she had no memories of. All her life, she'd believed her mother was dead, but there'd been a spark of hope somewhere deep inside. Hope that had been crushed that terrible night in January. And maybe Aspen was still grieving for her father, too. Garrett had spent a lot of time with his uncle after Deborah's confession. She was in prison and probably wouldn't be released until she'd served seven years of her ten-year sentence. The plea bargain her lawyer had secured for her had made Bart Bradley furious, but Aspen thought it was fair. Deborah had never meant for anybody to die.
Dean had recovered from the stab wound and was back to work building furniture. He visited his wife in the penitentiary whenever he could. Brent Salcido was also serving time. The town had reeled from the news of their mayor. But within a few weeks, a new mayor had been appointed by the town council, and everybody had moved on. Soon enough, she and Garrett would move on as well. Together, he took her hand and led her through the front door. It was amazing, her house's transformation. Garrett had created a masterpiece some family would be blessed to call home someday. Not her, though. As beautiful as it was, she'd be putting it on the market within the week. Aspen had rented a condo in the development where Garrett lived. She was taking online classes and working part-time in children's ministry at the church. One day, she hoped to get a full-time church position. God would open that door when she was ready to walk through it. For now, she had all she needed. Grandparents who loved her. A home surrounded by friends and neighbors who cared about her. And a man who would someday pledge his life to her. He showed off his handiwork, pointing out tiles she'd chosen from samples and crown molding she wouldn't have noticed. She was glad he'd finally gotten the place done. Word had already spread about the amazing job he was doing on the old place, and his schedule was booked for months. The way he'd poured himself into this renovation, so similar to the way he poured himself into their relationship, had her heart expanding. He opened one of the lower kitchen cabinets and pulled out a sliding shelf. To make it easier to get pots and pans, he looked at her, waiting for a reaction. It's nice. Nice? Apparently, that wasn't the reaction he was looking for, but she felt too overwhelmed by everything to think about the house. She took his hand, then took his other. His eyes scrunched. You don't like it? I like it, she said. It's perfect. You're perfect. Ha, huh, hardly. Perfect for me, she said. He squinted as he studied her. I keep telling you that. I love you, Garrett McCarthy. A smile spread across his face. I love you, Aspen Kincaid. And I just wanted to say, yes. Yes? Confusion crossed his features, and then his eyes lit up. Yes? Yes. As in... Not soon. Maybe in the fall, which everybody keeps telling me is beautiful. After I've had a little more time. Her words were cut off by his kiss just the first of the kisses she'd get to enjoy every day for the rest of her life. He lifted her and spun her around the new kitchen. I told you I'd wear you down. She was laughing by the time he set her on her feet. She gazed up into the face she adored. I never doubted you for a minute. The End You've been listening to Inheritance of Secrets, written by Robin Patchen, Narrated by Brian and Matilda. Copyright 2022 by Robin Patchen. Audio copyright 2024 by Robin Patchen.